Hi everyone. It's nice to nice to see you. Nice to get to be here with you again for class number three. This is well, I was gonna say this is an interesting class. That's a weird thing to say about your own class, I guess. It was an interesting study for me to do because um, I know that growing up as a Christadelphian, the way I often thought, and maybe the way you thought too, is that whenever you come to a passage where it seems like it's supporting some kind of false doctrine, um, some of the first thoughts you have, or maybe the first words out of your mouth is, aha, this is a translator bias. You know, this, here's the translator showing their bias. And in some cases, that's true. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. But what I want us to take out of this is that it's complicated. And, you know, you might be thinking, ah, you know, I don't, I don't want it to be complicated, but I kind of feel like there's, there's something really neat about the fact that just kind of in general in life, it's like, there's one thing that's not complicated and that's the gospel. The gospel is clear, straightforward, and it's that way purposefully. Everything else is complicated. <laughs> and I think that's, it's a helpful thing to just keep in mind. You know, that's, that's how God designed it. And I think that's good. It keeps us humble. So let's just take a look at, at where we're at here in this series. We are not actually on class four, even though it might look like it from the slide. Uh, we covered the first two points in class one. I might, it might be a good idea for me to fix that because that, that's a little confusing. But uh, what we're going to be looking at here is how, how do you decide as a translator how to translate things? And unfortunately, one of the factors that does come into play is a translator's beliefs. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. How does a translator's beliefs affect the way that they translate? So this class is called the bias of beliefs. We're going to discuss making a choice, how a translator has to make one. And obviously they're going to make a choice based off of what they believe the passage says, right? That, that would just be ridiculous to not do that. So, so they are going to make a choice, but I want to show you places where you can say, okay, yeah, I can see why they would make that choice you know the, the grammar is kind of ambiguous and and so yeah you could go with that or you could go with this but then i also want to show you a place and other places where there's like very clear intentional bias so i want to bring out some of those for you and then this last part here is called i've entitled it an evil plot question mark so is is there actually i think sometimes the way that we approach translation is it's almost like there's this evil like translator plot to try and convert everybody to like what their beliefs are. And, I, you know, while translators would probably be happy about that, I don't think that's necessarily um, what's always going on. There's not some kind of secret plot to like convince everyone. So we'll take a look at that. And what we're going to see there is there's some passages that we might say, aha, here's translator bias that actually, no, it's not translator bias. It's just, um, that's actually what the passage says. So, so we're gonna we're gonna go and take a look at that. Main message is translation isn't necessarily intended to deceive. That's the main message, because translation really is put together not to deceive, but to try and illuminate. You know, that's that's the whole point. You don't become a translator because you're like, ha ha ha, I'm gonna sneakily like convince everybody that I'm right. Like that's that's not how it goes, unless unless you really you know, think that there's some kind of giant like Bible conspiracy out there, but there probably isn't. Okay. The why question, why do translators bias their translations? So I want us to just think about that as we go into this class. Why do they bias their translations? And hopefully the answer will become evident as we go through. So ultimately translators have to make a choice as we discussed in the first class. They couldn't just they can't just say, well, here's this verse and it can be translated 11 different ways. That's not going to work. Um, otherwise, you'd have like monster Bibles and nobody would want to read it. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be very fun. So they have to choose between multiple translations of a verse. And obviously, the way that they understand the rest of the Bible is going to affect then how they translate when they look and they say, well, here's my 11 choices. They're going to say this one makes the most sense. I'm going to choose that one. And they're going to say that because they have their context of beliefs. And so therefore one 
version will make more sense to them than other ones do. So let me show you what I think is understandable bias. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that this is right. And actually, I think it's probably wrong. <laughs> but, but I think it's understandable, okay? So here's the King James Version. This is John 1, verses 3 to 5. Here's what it says. All things were made by him. This is talking about the word. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Okay, so that's the King James. What I want you to do is just take a look for the pronouns. So just look at this verse and look for the pronouns. So pronouns are words that stand for nouns. It's words like he, she, him, her. There's a few of them here. Here's what, here's what we got. Okay, four pronouns in this set. And the reason that this matters is you will notice that these pronouns have gender, right? Him is a masculine pronoun. It is a neuter pronoun. In other words, it doesn't have gender, you know, when you're talking about an it, right? Like I, when I was younger, I always used to talk about people's babies and I'd say, oh, look, it's cute. You know, the mom would be like, it's not an it. <laughs> that kind of thing. So, so it, uh, it, these pronouns, they all have the gender with them. And what's interesting about this is in English, we don't necessarily have gender in the same way that Greek has gender. So in English, we don't give gender to inanimate objects, right? That's why it's offensive to the mother when you call their baby an it. You know, it's, it's like you're saying, oh, this is not really a, a human or something. Like that. yeah, that's not what I meant when I said it, but, but it kind of implies that, right? So in English, we don't give gender to an inanimate object, but we do to objects that are alive. What's different about this is Greek actually gives gender to everything. So in Greek, you'd give gender to a tree. You'd give gender to a rock. That's just how Greek works. So, so as you take a look at this and you see these pronouns here and it says all things were made by him without him was not anything made that was made. Very much sounds like this is talking about something that's alive, right? In English. But knowing what we know now about Greek pronouns that it just assigns gender to everything regardless of whether or not it's alive. In English translations, we therefore remove gender when it's referring to an inanimate object. Let me show you what I mean by that. This is how the Greek gender would read. It would read exactly like what the King James says. So if you kept the gender of the Greek, it would read just like what the King James says. If you were to say, oh, well, English doesn't assign gender really to, to these kind of things. So uh, let's retranslate this. Here's how you could translate it. All things were made by it, and without it was not anything made that was made. In it was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Okay. You see the difference? It makes, it makes a big difference in how you understand the passage, that if you read it in the King James, it very much sounds like the word was this alive, living thing, like a person, right? If you take out the gender, which we typically would do in English for something that's inanimate, then it doesn't sound that way. All things were made by it, and without it was not anything made that was made. So you, you kind of have that flexibility as a translator. Now, I think that this is understandable bias for the translators of the King James Version. They read John 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. It, it makes it sound like the word is a thing. It makes it sound kind of like the word is a person, right? It's personification here. So because of that, they decided to translate the word as him with masculine pronouns. So I would say that's understandable bias. You know, you can look at that and you can say, okay, I get it. I can see why the translators did that. That, that makes sense. You know, the Greek, the Greek has that gender in it. And it sounds like 
you can read it as though this is, you know, a person, right? So I, I, that's understandable. Okay, not that I think that that's right. You know, I would have translated it as it, but I, I get what they're doing. Let me show you a place where I don't think this is understandable. And to me, where this is inexcusable bias. So take a look at this. This is John 14, verses 16 to 17 in the ESV. This is some of Jesus's last words to his disciples. And again, we're going to look for the pronouns, okay? So here's the pronouns. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Okay, do you notice what the helper is called throughout this passage? You see that it's called him, right? Now, here's something really interesting. So the helper is called him, right? But there's also another noun here that's given a pronoun. Actually, there's a couple. But the one that I want to focus on here is the noun, the world. Do you see the pronoun that the world is given? Just read through that again quickly. So the helper is called a him in the ESV. And the world is called it. Do you see that? Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Okay, so let's get that in our minds here. Here's the ESV. ESV says the helper is a him, and it says the world is an it. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Let's see what the Greek grammar actually says. So, you know, when we were reading John 1 in the King James, King James followed the Greek grammar, right? So it was good, you know, or at least understandable. Look at what the ESV does here in John 14. I, I thought that this was fascinating. Here's the Greek gender. See if you notice any changes. Greek gender says, I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he neither sees it nor knows it. You know it for it dwells with you and will be in you. Okay, so here's, here's the question. What gender is spirit of truth in the Greek? It's neuter. It doesn't have a gender. So the translators totally went against the Greek here and changed it to him. Because they were like, oh, well, you know, spirit. Spirit's a person. So, you know, it's got to be him. So they changed the it, the neuter pronoun here, to him. Now, what's really funny about this is it's totally inconsistent because they also changed the pronoun for world. Did you see that? Whom the world cannot receive because he neither sees it nor knows it. World is a masculine word in Greek. And so the translators were like, oh, well, spirit is obviously a person, so we're going to give it the masculine pronoun in English. The world obviously isn't a person. So because the world's not a person, we'll give it the neuter pronoun. And yet that's totally not what the Greek says here. So they were just totally, completely messing with the pronouns here to make it sound like the spirit is a person and the world's not. Okay, very inconsistent as far as that goes. So I, I say that that's inexcusable bias because to me, there's no, there is no grammatical reason to do what they did there. Okay. The spirit isn't gendered because of personification. Both the world and spirit are personified there. Okay. So that's just a little bit of an introduction to bias. So translators have to make a choice. And unfortunately, when they choose, it means that you can't really see the other possibilities. Okay. So let's talk about some intentional bias. That was a little taste here. And I want to walk us through specific places in different translations that have been purposefully biased. So there are times when it's, when it's intentional and it can have a big impact. So what I wanna show you right now is bias with syntax and the definite article. Let me explain to you what those things are first. So syntax is essentially like word order. Um, we're really big on word order in English. So 
if you were to say something in like out of word order, it sounds really weird. So instead of saying like, I ate soup for dinner, if I said for dinner soup, I ate, you know, you, you'd think I sounded really strange. <laughs> that, you know, that, that just wouldn't sound right. Well, it's the same kind of thing in other languages. You know, it's not the, it's not the exact same as how English works, but word order does mean something. Okay. Those of you who are in my Greek class are probably thinking, yeah, but word order is crazy in Greek. And you're right, it is. But it's, it's, it's different, but it's also the same. There are, there are things that word order shows you that uh, it, it wouldn't in, in other cases. In addition, the definite article matters. So let's take a look at some bias here. This is the New World Translation. Anybody ever spent some time with that, with a New World Translation? So this is the Jehovah's Witnesses translation. So this is the one that they generally read out of, the New World Translation. See if you notice anything that's atypical about this translation here. John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Anything you notice there that sounds like it's different than what maybe you've heard before? A God. A God. Intriguing, right? You know, as Christadelphians, we kind of look at this and we're like, oh, hmm, you know, it's kind of nice. Like, that's a little bit, I, I like that translation better. Well, unfortunately, what I, what I am here to present to you in the next uh, few slides is this translation is actually like really bad. So, so but, but don't worry, all is not lost. It's all okay. Um, but I, I want to show you some of the crazy bias that happened here in this translation. Okay, so this is how it looks in most typical translations. It's just going to say the word was God. So there's no article there. There's no A in front of the word God. You'll also notice the difference in, in capital letters, lowercase God versus uppercase God. All right, well, this is an interesting little booklet here, Should You Believe in the Trinity?, and this booklet, it's a Jehovah's Witness booklet, this booklet explains the translation. And I thought that this was fascinating. So I walked through this booklet and it was intriguing to see there was like truth mixed with error, which I guess, you know, I, sh I shouldn't be surprised by it, but it was, it was fascinating to see like the mingling of it. You know, I would read one sentence and be like, oh yeah, that's right. And then I'd read the next sentence and say, that's totally wrong. And it was, it was really, really fascinating. So I want to walk through this a little bit together. So this is the booklet, Should You Believe in the Trinity? I mean, you can check it out online if you want. I have a paper copy too. It gets handed out all the time. You've probably even had your own copy at some point. So take a look. Okay. Whoa. I, I did something weird here. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right. Well... I clearly didn't do my transitions right on here, so I'm going to have to just wing this part. All right, I want you to look at the top of, of this page. See how it says, notice too, how other translations render this part of the verse. Okay. I think this is really funny. So I don't know, those of you who have, who have given Bible classes before, sometimes you're tempted to say things like, here's this really awesome point, and look, Here's the like five different translations that agree with me, you know, that, that agree that this is what this should say. This is very much what this pamphlet is doing, but it does it in a really sneaky way. And here's why. So they say it should, it should read the word was a God, right? Just like the new world translation. So they're trying to back that up. So they say, look at how other translations render this part of the verse. Now, Let's think about this. They say other translations. They don't say, you know, how basically all translations that everybody uses render this verse. They, they end up quoting like, look at this. This is, I don't even know. I don't speak French. La Bible du centenaire, le evangile, whatever. Like, who, like, they're quoting a French Bible for the English. Like, that doesn't make any sense to do that. That's that, that is a bad choice, okay? 
<laughs> then if you look at this, one of two of these, sorry, sorry, three of them are German Bibles. Those are the blue ones. The red one is the very Bible that they're trying to support, the New World Translation, right? And get this. You see this 1864 one right here, the emphatic diaglot? Okay, this is a funny one, right? You know, we know the diaglot, and, and I respect the diaglot. I think it's great. Here's why it's funny. It says the emphatic diaglot, interlinear reading. Yeah, this is why it's so important to read carefully when you're looking at things. You know why it says interlinear reading? Let me show you this. Here's a, here's a screenshot of my diaglot. The interlinear reading is this left side. It says, in a beginning was the word, and the word was with the God, and a God was the word, right? It supports what they're saying. However, the problem is, is that nobody ever would use the interlinear reading as a translation because it doesn't make any sense. Like that's, that's the issue with interlinear readings. Like they just follow exactly the, what the Greek says, even in word order. So you get this, like, if you were to keep reading in here, it, it doesn't make sense if you read the interlinear. Like look at verse three, all through it was done. What? All through it was done. And without it was done, not even one that has been done. Like that does not make sense which is why on the right-hand side, the translator of the interlinear, Benjamin Wilson, went through and said, okay, I've given you the exact literal. Now let me tell you what it means. And you will notice that his translation here of the meaning does not support their translation. Okay, in other words, even, <laughs> even the translation that they turned to to say, see, it supports us, says, no, actually you're wrong. So there's some like deception going on here, unfortunately, or maybe I should, maybe I should give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe there's like a lack of scholarship. Maybe that's what we should say. Okay. Anyway, you can decide what you think about that. All right. Here's what they go on next to say. And I, I think that this is pretty good. They say at John one verse one. So that's what we're looking at. There are two occurrences of the Greek noun theos. Okay, I know that you can't read Greek. I recognize that. Well, maybe some of you can. So I've circled them for you in the green, okay? So there's two theoses. Now, if you wanna be really technical, you can argue this, this first one actually says theon, not theos, but you know that's, that's their issue here, not mine. Okay, so they say there's two occurrences of the Greek noun theos, God. The first occurrence refers to almighty God. That's right. So, you know, this was one of those cases where I was reading it and I was like, yeah, okay, good. With whom the word was. The first theos is preceded by the word tone. Okay, so that's this word here in front of it, tone. Okay, interesting. It's the word the. A form of the Greek definite article that points to a distinct identity, in this case, almighty God. So everything they say in this, in this paragraph is great. First time that you see the word God, it has the word the in front of it. Okay. So no, no issues there. They then go on and say this, which I think is fascinating. See, like this is, this is where it was like, yes, no, yes, no. So it says, the next paragraph says, on the other hand, there is no article before the second Theos at John 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, that's also true. So now if you were just thinking about this, you would say, okay, first God has the in front of it. Second God doesn't. So you know, the first instance would be like the God. The second one would be like a God, right? That's, that's what you would think. And that's what they proceed to say. They say, so a literal translation would read, and God was the word, or and a God was the word, right? There's no definite article. There's no the. The only problem is when they say, so a literal translation would read, is that they completely ignored syntax, which indicates that this translation is like really wrong. And there are no literal translations that agree with what they just said a literal translation should say. That's kind of a big deal. <laughs> so let me, let me show you this. Here's Young's literal translation. Let's see. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That is not, and God was the word, which is what they 
Sadith literal translation would be. Here's Green's literal translation. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Huh. Well, look at that. I mean, what literal translation are they talking about? Like, there, there's not a ton in existence. And all the ones I looked at completely, like, blew up what they were saying. Okay. So, yeah, that didn't work so good. All right. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I recognize this is a lot of, like, grammary stuff. Okay. The next paragraph goes on to say this. The Journal of Biblical Literature says that expressions with, you ready for this awesome word, with an anarthrous predicate preceding the verb are primarily qualitative in meaning. Okay, that probably doesn't make any sense. And I will tell you, I actually had to read it like four or five times to try and figure out what's going on here. So what they mean is this. If you have a word in front of your verb that doesn't have the, okay, and it happens to be a predicate, we're not going to get into what that is, just because you don't need to know. It's a, it's a specific like grammar construction, okay? So there's this grammar construction that has no article. Their point here is that it's qualitative. In other words, it's showing a quality of something. So like the way that you would translate this to show a quality is godlike, right? That's a quality of something, you know? It, it's like an adjective, a way to describe something, godlike. Or uh, a, maybe a better way would be like divine. And what the Journal of Biblical Literature says here is true. You can go through and you can find passages in scripture with the same kind of construction and the noun or the, the, uh, the word becomes qualitative. It becomes like a quality, right? So that's good. Now, what's really funny about this, okay, so that's good, da, 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 is that here's what they go on to say. So again, it was agree, disagree, agree, disagree. So look at what they say. So John 1, 1 highlights the quality of the word. Good. That he was divine, godlike. Now look at what they do. They just add on a God. What? Like, how is that? How is that a quality? <laughs> that's not a quality. Divine, godlike, yes, that's good. But a God, that doesn't fit with the grammar. This harmonizes with the rest of the Bible, which shows that Jesus here called the word and his role as God's spokesman was an obedient subordinate sent to earth by a superior almighty God. In other words, what they do is they go through and they like, they try and sound all grammary and like scholarly and everything. But they just end up coming back to, oh, and by the way, our translation's right even though everything we just showed to support it says that our translation is wrong. They just like slip it in there, a God. And then for the rest of the article, they ignore that they said it could mean divine or godlike. Isn't that fascinating? Like that doesn't show up again. Divine or godlike doesn't show up again. And all it is, is it's got to be translated as a God. Okay. Lame. Now, again, here is a non-Jehovah's Witness grammar that talks about this. And this is helpful. The most likely candidate for theos, so that's the word God, is qualitative, right? Equality, divine, godlike. This is true both grammatically of the larger proportion of pre-verbal and arthrous, forget that, we're not gonna read that, and theologically. <laughs> Possible translations are as follows. What God was, the word was, or the word was divine, All right? So that's, that's a helpful thing to recognize because the point that John is trying to make, you know, I, I read this as referring to the new creation. The point that John is trying to make is here is the Lord Jesus who, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Like this is not, it's not saying they're the same person. It's not saying Jesus is God, that kind of thing. It is saying that he is what God was, right? This fits perfectly with the grammar. Okay, now that was just an instance of uh, some intentional bias that you can see there on the part of the Jehovah's Witness translation as far as syntax goes. Here's bias with certain terms. This is a very interesting one. I wanna go back into the 1500s and let's take a look at Tyndale's translation. Now, I did have to change some of the spelling. <laughs> But uh, not, not a ton here. So see if you notice, this is 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 4. 
See if you notice anything, those of us who are used to the King James Version, see if you notice anything that's different in Tyndale. Now, Tyndale came before the KJV. So here's what Tyndale says. He says, though I spake with the tongues of men and angels and yet had no love, I were as a sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. Though I could prophesy and understand all secrets and all knowledge, yet if I had all faith so I could move mountains out of their places, and yet had no love, I were nothing. Though I bestowed all my goods to feed the poor, and though I gave my body, even that I burned, and yet had no love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long and is courteous. Love endeth not, love doth not frowardly, swelleth not, dealeth. <laughs> okay, so that's Tyndale, right? You can understand why we don't read that on Sundays. Now, question, did you notice what's different? There's a lot of things, granted, but there's a big major difference here between this and the KJV. Here. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Do you see the difference there? Tyndale said love. KJV says charity. Interesting change, right? Hmm. Well, this is a purposeful bias. Not on the part of Tyndale. Well, actually, it is on the part of Tyndale, and it's on the part of the King James. So take a look at this. This is a very interesting story to follow. Okay. This is from Dialogue Concerning Heresies by Sir Thomas More. This is again from the 1500s. Thomas More is the Catholic bishop who caught William Tyndale for translating the scriptures. He was very angry with Tyndale. He had him burned at the stake for it. This is what Thomas More said about Tyndale. Now, again, I'm sorry, you know, we got to work through the, the 1500s language here, but notice what he says about Tyndale using love. Okay. So he says, for surely if he had changed the common known word into the better. So if he had made a good change, he says, I would well allow it. If he changed it into as good, I would suffer it. You know, if the change was like equal, I put up with it. He says, if somewhat into worse, so he did it seldom, I would wink at it. So he says, if he made a bad change, but only did it sometimes, I'd wink at it. You know, I, I just ignore it. <laughs> so some, some good old English. But now, when he changeth the known usual names of so great things, he's talking about the change from the word charity. So Tyndale changed charity into love. Okay. And then it got changed back in the KJV. He says, when he changes the known usual names of so great things into so far the worse, and that not repeateth seldom. So he did it all the time, he said. But so often and so continually inculcateth that almost in the whole book, his lewd change, he never changeth. <laughs> so, so he's saying he did it all the time. He could have said this in a little simpler way. In this manner, could no man deem other but that the man meant mischievously. So he says, the only thing you can take out of this is that he was being evil. But now the cause why he changed the name of charity is no very great difficulty to Luther's heresies perceive. Okay. So he says, and why did he change charity to love? Oh, I know. Cause I've read Luther. He's saying, and Luther started this whole evil reformation, right? So he's real bothered about Martin Luther because he's Catholic. He says, for since Luther and his fellows, among other, their damnable heresies have won. So the worst thing he says out of Luther and his teachings is that all our salvation standeth in faith alone and toward our salvation, nothing force of good works. Okay. He says the big issue is Tyndale changed this because he believes in faith alone and not works. And you might think, what? Change charity to love? What's that have to do with works versus faith? The reason is, you know what charity means? It means 
good works. It means going out, giving to the poor, right? And so this was changed to love, which is more seen sometimes as a feeling, right? So Thomas More was very upset by this and said, it's all about faith alone. This is a reformation change, right? So he's very angry about this. Okay, here's another interesting change that Tyndale made. This is Ephesians 5, 23 to 25. Here's what he says. For the husband is the wife's head, even as Christ is the head of the congregation, and the same as the savior of the body. Therefore, as the congregation is in subjection to Christ, likewise, let the wives be in subjection to their husbands in all things. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the congregation and gave himself for it. Ready? Here's KJV. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be to their own husband. You see it? Congregation. I mean, we would actually like that translation better, right? Like we always talk about ecclesia, which is what congregation is. So interesting. Okay. So it got changed to church. Now, as you can imagine, Thomas More was upset about that too. This is what Tyndale said. This is how he explained his changes. He says, inasmuch as the clergy hath appropriated unto themselves the term church, that of right is common unto the whole congregation of them that believe in Christ. He says, we're all part of this. It's not just the clergy. It's not just the priests that are the church. We all are. He says, therefore, in the translation of the New Testament, where I found the word ecclesia, I interpreted it by the word congregation. I mean, that sounds almost like a Christadelphian wrote that, right? <laughs> okay, this is an interesting book here by Brian Moynihan. It's called God's Bestseller. He goes on and he explains these changes. He says, the use of the word congregation was an alarm bell for any English speaker. Tyndale was using it in place of church. As in the Testament himself, he translated the Greek, ecclesia, as congregation and not as church. This was a direct threat to the church's ancient, but, so Tyndale here made clear, non-scriptural, claim to be the body of Christ on earth. To change these words was to strip the church hierarchy of its pretension to be Christ's terrestrial representative and to award this honor to the individual worshipers who made up each congregation. It changed the religion. Tyndale reinforced this in the choice of three other words. Instead of priest, he used senior or elder for the Greek presbuteros, stressing the abundance, or sorry, the absence of any priestly hierarchy in scriptural times. He rendered the Greek metaouete as repent instead of do penance, which the church with its huge vested interest in the lucrative penitential industry of pardons and indulgences insisted was the correct translation of the Vulgate's, I don't even know Latin, poententium agite, whatever that is. So it might be from the Latin, but Tyndale was working from the Greek original. He also translated the Greek agape as love, now abideth faith, hope, and love, even these three, but the chief of these is love. Rather than as charity, this too was a notion dangerous to the church for the apparent downgrading of charity might undermine the lucrative donations, indulgences, and bequests with which the faithful were persuaded to pave their way to heaven. Right? This was a big deal. Intentional bias, right? On the part of Tyndale, because he says, no, this isn't right. I'm changing it. And intentional bias then in the King James. So I don't know if you were aware, but the King James translation had 15 principles of interpretation that all the translators had to agree to. Principle number three was this, the old ecclesiastical words to be kept, viz. as the word church, not to be translated congregation. In other words, we're reversing what Tyndale did there. Kind of interesting, you know? It, uh, we, we should say, well, we're not, we're not gonna use the KJV anymore. We're all gonna read Tyndale. Just kidding, that did it. I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> Okay, now I, I wanna show you a, another interesting piece of bias. So we've seen bias with syntax in the definite article. We've seen bias with, uh, um, with individual words. Now I wanna show you bias with gender. This is an interesting kind of thing to deal with. And unfortunately, I'm just gonna put this out here and you can think about this, but I wanna show you how it was, things were changed. Romans 16, seven KJV. This is a good translation here. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. See that word there, Junia? Want to guess the gender? 
Junia is? Ionias in Greek? It's feminine. Feminine noun. Now, apostles there, apostolos, that's apostles. That's what that word means. So what happened is some people looked at this and said, huh, that's interesting. Andronicus and Junia, a man and a woman, are his kinsmen and are apostles, according to this verse. Now, apparently that bothered some people because if you take a look at the New American Standard, look at this. You notice it doesn't say Junia. It says Junias. The RSV says Junias. Young's Literal says Junias. You want to take a guess at the gender of Junias? Junias is a masculine noun. Now that's fascinating because if you look at any Greek manuscripts, I have not found any Greek manuscript that supports this rendering. So I have no idea where it came from. The best, the best I can come up with is that some people were really bothered by this idea and so they wanted to change it. Now, I'm not going to try and explain Romans 16.11. That's outside of the purview of this class. Okay. My point is, is that there is bias sometimes in translations. And the reason that we want to use multiple translations is because it allows us to see that bias, right? Things are complicated and having a whole bunch of translations is really helpful. Okay. So there you go. Fascinating. Masculine noun. Okay. So the question becomes then, is this an evil plot? Is it like, you know, translators are sitting there thinking, okay, what, what can we do to like subordinate other people to us and make them agree with what we think? Well, you know, maybe in some cases that happens, but I, I don't think that's always the case. So if you find a Bible verse that you think, okay, that definitely sounds like the translators were trying to support their own belief, that probably is true. They were, but that's because that made sense to them. You know, they, they were looking at it and thinking, okay, how should I translate this? And a legitimate translation fit with their beliefs. Okay. So that's what I want us to see. It's not, it's not like every place that, that is difficult is translators, you know, trying to mess it up or something. It's that sometimes the grammar is kind of tough to figure out. Okay. So I want to show you that in some cases, some of the bias, some things that might appear to be bias, actually aren't. So this is why we need to be careful at saying, oh, this is translator bias. If we don't know the language, if we don't know the syntax, that's a dangerous thing to say. Because there are a few cases where actually things that appear to be translator bias are just translators translating better than what happened before. So let me show you this. This is an awesome, super old book. This book is from the early 1800s. It was written by this guy with also an awesome first name, which is Granville. So Granville Sharp. Granville Sharp came up with, ready for this? What is known as the Granville Sharp rule. Okay, you know, <laughs> I guess to be expected. So he came up with the Granville Sharp rule and he wrote a book on it. Okay, now why he wrote an entire book on the Granville Sharp rule, I'm not sure because he really could have accomplished this in like five pages, but he decided to write a whole book. Okay, and you know, just, just like John Thomas's awesome 1800 stuff, right? Look at, look at the sweet title. Remarks on the uses of the definite article in the Greek text of the New Testament containing many new proofs of the divinity of Christ from the passages which are wrongly translated in the common English version. Ha, huh, ha, huh. okay, anyway. So that, that's what he calls this. He came up with the, this Granville Sharp rule. Now I wanna show you what this is. Okay. And obviously, just as a disclaimer, I'm not using it to prove the divinity of Christ in case you notice that in the title. <laughs> okay, here's how he defines the rule, okay? This is probably gonna be a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but don't worry, I'll explain it. When the copulative chi connects two nouns of the same case, viz. nouns, either substantive or adjective or participles, a personal description respecting office, dignity, affinity, or connection, and attributes, properties, or qualities, good or ill, if the article ho or any of its cases precedes the first of the said nouns or participles and is not repeated before the second noun or participle, the latter always relates to the same person that is expressed or described by the first noun or participle, i.e., it denotes 
a farther description of the first name person. Whew, that was one sentence. Can you believe that? Okay, now he could have said this in a much simpler way, and here's what it is. When the word and joins together two nouns, and there is one definite article, there's one the in front of the first noun, and not a the in front of the second noun, the two nouns are about the same thing. Okay, that still might be hard to grasp, so I'll show you some examples. Okay, this is Matthew 12, verse 22, in the Greek. I recognize you cannot read Greek, so here is a nice translation for you. There's the KJV. Okay, it says, then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. All right, he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Okay, this part I have underlined here is the blind and dumb. The blind and dumb. Now, here's your word and, here's your two nouns, blind, dumb, and here's your article. So you have an article in front of the noun joined with and. This is exactly what Granville Sharp was writing about. You know, this, this is why we appreciate people who do dissertations on Greek because, you know, th this is like he did his whole dissertation on this, right? Can you imagine that? That would, you'd, you'd like go insane. So <laughs> this, is what, uh, this is what he did. He read through all the Greek New Testament and looked for these. <laughs> and he, he finally found these and, and made up this rule and he figured it out and it seems to hold. Okay, so the point is, is that when you see this, these two nouns are about the same person. In other words, if you read the King James, in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw, it sounds like it's talking about two different groups, blind and a dumb. And that's because Granville Sharp came in the 1800s, right? KJV translators didn't know the rule because nobody had studied it. Right? So he notices this. So notice the New King James. They make that clear. It says, then was one brought to him who was demon possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Right? They take both those nouns and they say, aha, this is about one person. The blind and mute man spoke and saw. Okay. Here it is in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Here's the King James, blessed be God, even the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, father of mercies, God of all comfort. Okay, I've underlined it here in the Greek for you. This is the God and father is what that says. God and father. So you have God is your noun, father is your noun, joined by and with the article in front. Granville Sharp construction. King James, blessed be God, even the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That kind of sounds like it, you know, is the same thing. Blessed be God, even the Father. Here it is in the New King James. It again makes that identification sharper. No pun intended. Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Makes it clear this is talking about one person, the God and the Father. Same thing. Okay. The reason that this is interesting is there's two verses here where this construction is used about Jesus. Here's what it says in the King James. Looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. When you read both of these in the KJV, it sounds as though Jesus is separate from God in the KJV here. And we are liable to read these and say, aha, see, KJV, better translation, the translators were just biased in the newer translations, because let me show you how newer translations translate this. Here's the New King James. It says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is very clearly called God here in the New King James. The thing is, is that this is the Granville Sharp rule, right? This is calling Jesus God in the Greek, right? Same thing in 2 Peter 1.1. Granville Sharp rule, same kind of deal. Here's the King James, here's the new King James. It says, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't wanna be misunderstood here. Let's not, again, I'm not trying to say, you know, Jesus is one substance with God or anything along those lines. I'm trying to make us uh, see what the Greek grammar is saying. <laughs> like, and the Greek grammar is very clearly in this place calling Jesus God. Now, that should not bother us. There are a lot of places in scripture where Jesus is called God. And we shouldn't look at those passages and be afraid or say, ah, oh man, it's the Trinity or something like that. We should look at that 
And we should be in awe of who the Lord Jesus is, that he so strongly reflected God that he's called God, right? That, that's amazing. That it, that's astonishing about the Lord, and that should put us in awe of him. So I don't think we should be afraid of what the Greek grammar says, but we should just be informed that here's what's going on with the grammar, right? That's a helpful thing to know about. Okay. So my point is, it should demonstrate that not all changes in the newer translations that appear to support other beliefs are translator bias. So we really should look deeply before we make that accusation, because if we just say, oh, well, that's translator bias, then we miss that, no, actually, that's what the text says. And, and if that's what the text says, don't we want to know it? Like, isn't that important? You know, as Bible students, as Christadelphians who love the Bible, like that's, that's a big deal. We want to know what the text says. And I think the other thing that this shows us is that knowledge of Hebrew and Greek is always growing. You know, in the 1800s, when Granville Sharp came along and figured out that rule, people who had translated Bibles before that had no idea about it, right? And that's still happening now. You know, there's there has been an explosion in an understanding of Greek it, since the 1990s. So that's, I mean, that's huge, right? So like newer translations, like the NIV that was updated in 2011, ESV that was updated in 2016, NASB was updated 2020. Like these translations are going to reflect the latest scholarship that before that people didn't know. And that's a helpful thing to be aware of. It's a helpful thing to understand. So to sum it up, all translation is bias. It's just how it works. We're humans. You know, it's how it goes. <laughs> translation has to be biased because that's how it goes. Sometimes the bias is intentional. Other times we misidentify it as intentional. And so what I want us to take from this is that translation isn't necessarily intended to deceive. You know, I think translators go into it because they actually want to help people. The solution, though, because of translator bias, is to keep reading more than one version. Keep reading more than one version, get familiar with other versions, know what they say, and then start looking at, the, like there's books in which translators explain why they made the choices they made. And you can actually, I mean, you can get one. I, I just picked one up actually, by the way, about the, uh, the NIV, why translators translated the things that they did in the NIV. There's one for the NRSV. Like, if you're curious about it, check it out. You know, translators want to explain what they did. They don't want to just, you know, seem like they know everything and nobody else does or something. Like, they, they, want, they want to make that clear. So, to sum it all up, what Bible should you use? Well, I think it's important for us to be informed. Know what translations are formal and which are functional. Use both of them. Study from a formally equivalent and read from a functionally equivalent. When they're different, look at a lot of different translations and try and see what's going on. Remember which ones are formal and functional. Look for idioms, look for figurative language, and then ask somebody who knows the languages or learn the language yourself. You know, I'll, I'll always keep putting that in because I, you know, I think it's great. If you ever have the, the opportunity, even, you know, don't, even if you don't want to become like, you know, fluent, just spending some time looking at the languages so that you understand how they work. It's, it's huge. All right. So that's it for this week. And, uh, Looking forward to when we can jump in next week, or not next week, but next next time. Next time we're going to talk about Hapax Legomena, which uh, probably sounds like a food. It's not. It um, it's it's Greek for words that only occur one time, which are really challenging because there's how do translators supposed to know what they mean? Okay, thank you very much.